Welcome to Transforming Human Consciousness. I am Kayvon Geola. And this program is sponsored by the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Claremont. The focus of transforming human consciousness is to open our consciousness to a principle that we are all one human race. Now, how much of this reality and this principle as a whole we are aware of, it's an issue to be explored, especially with my guest, Joni Hamilton, who is an educator, a parent, and a member of the community who is involved in this process, exploring it, looking at it, observing it, and really having a story about it. It's so wonderful to have you, Joni, here. I know we're going to have a wonderful time here exploring this issue. Um, there's a saying in the uh, vision of race unity peace message, um, which says, racism is the most challenging issue facing America. Mm -hmm. Most challenging issue. I mean, this is a big country. Yes, and is. most challenging issue. Is that really befitting it? I mean, from your perspective, I, is, does, is racism most challenging issue or are we so. making it too big? No, I think it is the most challenging issue that we are confronted with today. Um, I think the problem is a lot of people don't want to um, admit that there is a problem. Hmm. So if you deny that the problem exists, then you, you, never, you never face up to it. So in, in that case, it continues, it perpetuates itself. You know, when I was, um, I grew up in Iran, mm. and as a Baha'i, I remember that um, there were so many things that was part of my consciousness that I knew that I couldn't do. For mm. example, I would never go in certain places. I would never mm. go into some people's ho homes because of the dangers which involved um, me being a Baha'i of the persecution of the Baha'is of Iran. There were certain words, for example, that I wouldn't be saying greetings like that would reveal my identity. Now, fortunately, you know, um, I couldn't be detected just by my looks because mm -hmm. I look like everybody else. Do you think that um, average people, especially those who are not African American, take it for granted, things that they can do or they cannot do, um, that we are absolutely not aware of? Oh, definitely, because it's, for them, it's the norm. They haven't been denied their rights. So they can't even imagine how it would feel for someone to tell them that they could not gain entrance uh, to a restaurant or a um, uh, theater because they were white. That, I mean, since they've never experienced that, they don't know how that feels um, because they've been, I guess, the privileged group or the chosen group, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and they don't even have a clue as to, you know, what that type of discrimination feels like. So yes, I, I think they do take those, um, those, um, that privilege for granted. I really do. So, so a lack of um, really education, right? And understanding and compassion. Um, it's like you don't know how I feel until you've walked a mile in my shoes. Right. You can't really relate to it. You can say you empathize, but you but you can't sympathize because you you need to feel it to sympathize. Right. So um, from that aspect, I think that they don't have a clue. They really don't. And they don't know that they're part of the problem because they don't even recognize that the problem exists. There's a lot of people in denial. Um, because things are better, it's like it's over. We're, on a, we're in a new millennium here. Um, stop bringing up the past. Well, you're not bringing up the past. We're still living it on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis. You just don't live that way. So they can't relate. Mm, Joni, um, I know you, mm, you are um, a wife of a physician, mm -hmm. you are an educator yourself, you um, live in a very affluent part of the um, neighborhood, you know, the community. Um, in your situation, do you have to deal with it, um, or is it something that you have to go seek it out oh, in order no. to get into some situation? Oh, no. I, in my wildest dreams, I never would have thought that I would still be confronted with the type of racism that I used to hear about as a child that I never 
um, experience, but as an adult in 1995, 96, it's still here and it's very alive and very real. For instance, um, I have an, um, a Mercedes. To get stopped by a police officer and have him to come up to your window and ask you, whose car is this? Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Um, shouldn't you be out there pursuing criminals? but to be harassed like that. Or for instance, um, uh, back in the spring, we had an incident where we were driving down the freeway um, and we got pulled over, but we didn't just get pulled over. Uh, what had happened was we had been in Los Angeles for an afternoon and we were on our way back home. And um, when we got on the freeway, on the Santa Monica freeway, I noticed that there was a helicopter overhead and I didn't pay any attention because helicopters, you know, monitor the flow of traffic all the time. And this was what you and... This was my, me, my husband and my three children. And then we transitioned, we came on and we got on the 60 freeway. And as we got around Paramount, I noticed that there were like five or six police cars lined up on the shoulder of the road. And I told my husband, oh, they're after somebody. Needless to say, at the time, I didn't realize it was us. So when we got around um, Rosemead exit, uh, I saw the police car in my um, passenger rearview mirror um, zigzagging the highway, slowing the traffic down. And at that point, I thought, well, at least we missed the SIG alert. <laughs> well, um, then he falls behind us turns on his lights and tells us to pull over to the side of the road, which we did. At that point, there are police cars in every lane when we were heading east on the 60. And it, as I looked across, all the traffic heading west on the 60 had been stopped and there were police cars in every lane there. And then that helicopter that I had seen was hovering overhead with a sharpshooter and a guy on a bullhorn. The off-ramp um, was filled with police cars and the on-ramp to the freeway was then filled with police cars and um, they spoke to us from the bullhorn they told my husband to take his left to roll down the window to take his left hand out of the car and open the door remove himself from the car hands up back up go down at his knees and then face down on the freeway then I was in the passenger seat and they told they instructed me to come across to the driver's side, exit the car, and just as I turned around to get out the car, I looked back and I saw a police officer looking at me and his eyebrow went up like, I don't think this is quite right. But they continued and we I got out, I backed up up the freeway, down on my knees, face down. Then they told the kids, our three kids, one at a time to get out the car. We're all laid out on the freeway. And then one approaches us with the gun to our head and the other one, the second uh, police officer, puts the handcuffs on all of us. Now, mind you, they've never um, asked for any ID. You know how they usually ask for your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. They never ask for any of this. And while my husband is asking, asking them, now, what's going on here? And there, everyone, nobody knows anything. No one knows anything. And they put the handcuffs on and they help us to stand up and then they move, move us to the side of the road. And um, so I asked this female officer, there was an African-American officer, what was going on? And she said she had just gotten a report o over her um, radio that there was a pursuit of some hijackers, some carjackers. And if you, ha if you were free, they needed your help. So supposedly, the story was that we had hijacked a car in Los Angeles on Thursday. And the person whose car had been hijacked saw us when we were in Los Angeles, called the police on his car phone, and there the pursuit began. They he, and the thing that uh, really got my goat, though, was the guy lied. He told the police that he made a positive ID, that he had made eye contact with everyone in the car. And um, our car has tinted windows, and we all had sunglasses on because it was a real sunny day. So he lied. And then the police still, you know, 
in spite of all of that, they continued uh, their pursuit. They stopped us. That was the explanation that they e eventually gave us. Uh, they subsequently took the handcuffs off of me and my daughters, but they kept them on my husband, who is a surgeon, and my son, uh, who is a student. He was 13 years old until this guy came on the premises to identify us one way or the other. And I could see him down the road shaking his head saying that, no, we weren't the people. And it wasn't until after that that they took the handcuffs off my husband and my son. Well, needless to say, everybody was just totally mm. outraged and, could, you know, mm. would feel with disbelief. It was a terrible experience. Um, no one ever said they were sorry. It's <laughs> like, well, you know, no, the, the, the sergeant in charge just in charge did say he was sorry um, but what and then he asked me well what would you have me do I said well you know would you have done this if it had been a white physician and his wife and their three kids in a suburban on a Sunday would you have stopped them the way you stopped us and of course he couldn't say anything so yeah racism is alive and well and um, until we uh, become a little more sensitive uh, to these issues and to other people and stop um, attaching every stereotype that, and I think racism is a learned behavior, that you've been learned to people who are different than you, then it will continue. Ooh. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just blown away. Mm. Um, Joni, why don't we um, take a break? We do okay. need a break. Sure. <laughs> and then when we come back, we're going to continue just to go and look and see what is it that we need to do in order to really free ourselves from this horrible situations that can happen. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a break and we come back for our audience. Please stay tuned and we shall be back. Life. You're born, you're all potential like a blank slate. You get to fill it any way you want. Now, you're a canvas. Yeah, you're like a brand new canvas. You can go wild on it. Uh, maybe you're more like a lump of clay that can be molded into anything. Well, the idea is simple. Fill up your life. Just keep drugs out of it, huh? After all, your life is the only whatever you got. It's a life or drugs situation. <laughs> Right now, Americans 18 to 80-something are using their heads to solve the world's toughest problems. Today's Peace Corps volunteers are effective business advisors, among the first to teach AIDS prevention and the world's largest environmental workforce. Listen to the heartbeat of the Earth. All life depends on that beat. The Earth has always provided for us. Today, as in the past, we must keep this heart strong. Welcome back to Transforming Human Consciousness. We are continuing our conversation with Joni Hamilton, who is an educator, a mother, a wife, um, and a community member, sharing her experience on this issue of racism. She had the story that you shared, it really strikes you when you're here. It would be difficult, I would say, for anybody to hear a story like that and not feel a sense of shock. Mm -hmm. um, yet, um, it seems like it's not an isolated kind of a thing. Oh, no. It, it goes on. It goes on, cave on. Um, I even have a, an acquaintance right here in the Claremont area who was stopped because he drives an expensive car, black male. Um, on his way to uh, an emergen a hospital emergency. Mm -hmm. He gets stopped, first question is asked, whose car is this? Um, no, ask, no question about his ID or anything, and uh, he was on his way to a medical emergency, and the police officer's response was, uh, if you were a real doctor, um, you would have called an ambulance. Hmm. That kind of stuff is so ignorant. You know, and uh, it just kind of, you wonder, now how did this person get this job? They've um, pledged to serve and protect the people. Well, I am the people. So mm -hmm. I expect them to serve and protect me from criminals, from people that are out there doing wrong, not to harass me because my skin is black. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm hopeful, but it just, it seems to be a problem that just doesn't want to go away because people won't let it go away. So we really need to educate people and, and make them more sensitive to the feelings of their fellow man. Mm. And um, 
But yeah, it's very much alive. Well, Jody, I have known you, and I know you're very positive spirit. You know, you mm. approach things with a proactive spirit. Oh, you, definitely. you're always looking to be part of the solution. Right. I know you're involved with the school, with the um, school board, all those activities. Is there a fear somewhere um, about this issue that will not get resolved deep down somewhere? Well, I think the fear is, I don't have a fear because long, as long as I am a living, breathing entity in this society, I will work toward changing those attitudes that um, keep us from coming together as one race, mm -hmm. as a part of the human race. So I don't have a fear, but I do see that fear in the faces of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that is what I'm taken aback by, that they are so afraid of addressing the issue and then taking steps to change it. Um, Sometimes I feel like I'm in a time warp. Um, is this the 50s or is this the 90s? <laughs> and um, so, no, I'm not afraid at all. I'm, at, I'm very much at peace with myself. Um, I operate from a spiritual core. It's very good. And I know that what I'm trying to do and what I am accomplishing is for the good of man, just not for my own good. Hmm. So I try to educate my children. Well, I have educated my children. You know, race is not an issue at our house or the, the different races are not an issue. We try or we practice judging people by the content of their character and they're jerks in every race. So, you know, I mean, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a good person, if your energy is positive, um, if I feel like I can trust you to some extent, then you're okay with me. Hmm. And that's basically <laughs> all you need to have those traits for me to be genuinely interested in you. I'm interested in you if you don't have those traits. I pray for you if you don't have those traits because mm -hmm. that needs something within you needs to change. Yeah. Johnny, what is, um, what is there that gives you um, this energy, this hope? That keep going well I think it's I'm connected to the light you know um, there is a spiritual awareness um, that I know exists there I, I believe in that there is a God hmm. and you know all things come from God and all that is God is good so you know just operating from that basis it uh, makes me know that we can achieve if we desire to, and that's where you know you start talking about free will. The choice is yours. Hmm. Um, so you decide you don't want to be a part of the solution, then you are a part of the problem. There is no gray area. You can't straddle the fence. You're really whether or not you admit it or not, you're on one side of the fence or the other. So I want to be a part of that solution, operating from that positive power. Which is what would God you power. What would you like to see happening um, today, let's like say in our schools? Well, with regard to our schools, you know, there's so much diversity in the school. And everyone kind of comes to school to learn the academics, but there's not much a social interaction. Everyone is comfortable or they uh, give the appearance of being comfortable, of going back to their own little niche and, you know, staying, you know, with where they're comfortable. Um, I would like to see there be more education about our cultural differences and, and, and enlightenment about how we are connected and to celebrate those things that make us uniquely us. Um, I think that's beautiful. Hmm. So that's how I feel about, you know, what could be done in school, just really more education, more exposure. What would be, um, what do you mean by exposure? Exposure to those things that aren't normally a part of your everyday life. So you have a sense of knowing what's going on with the other folks. Mm -hmm. So then you develop a comfort level and you then you feel connected in some way. So that's the type of exposure that I'm talking about. So somewhat of uh, um, creating a village where we can be all um, connected with one another, know about each other, uh, spend time with one another, oh, definitely. eat with each other. Oh, sure. Come we, and go. We have to experience um, our differences before we can truly understand what the other person is about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lack of understanding that many people operating from operate from a, a source of ignorance, and I don't think that they even realize that they are ignorant. 
you know, um, their lives appear to be full. Um, there's nothing wrong. They live um, by looking through rose-colored glasses. And as long as my life is okay, everything is okay. Well, that's really not okay because we have to interface with one another. And mm -hmm. I need to know that when I'm talking to you, that when you look at me, that all you see is not just black um, or all that I see is just not Iranian or Persian. Um, so um, there, there needs to be a lot of educate, educating. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't have all the answers. All I can do is start with myself. And I try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, you know. Um, you're okay with me about. until you give me a reason f for you not to be okay with me. That's right. That's right. If, if, we, if we all did that, we yeah. would give each other a chance. We have to trust. Mm -hmm. We have to trust. Mm -hmm. And we're g getting so much away from that. You know, there's so much fear out there. And, you know, that's not of God. So I'm not fearful. I believe that people will do the right thing. I have to hope for that. Mm -hmm. I have to hope for that. That helps to sustain me. <laughs> um, I remember you mentioned that um, you lived in the South. Oh, yes. I was very fearful uh, about moving down to Tennessee. I'm, I'm from born and raised in California. And um, I lived a very nice life, you know. I was no trauma. <laughs> and um, but. You know, all the stories about living down south and being black, and I didn't want to experience that, so I was fearful. But my husband uh, decided to become a doctor, and he went to medical school down in Tennessee. So I moved down there with him. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, one thing about so southern racism, you know it. There's no question about if this person doesn't like you, as opposed to the type of racism that I think exists here, you know, in my community. It's very subtle. I would prefer the outright. I don't bother you, you don't bother me. I don't want anybody to try to hurt me because they don't care for me. You just leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. And that's something that I appreciated about the South. It was honest. Mm. It was an honest existence. So my uh, white friends were truly my friends. I still um, communicate with them today, and those people who didn't want to be associated with me, they didn't, and we don't. Mm. And that's all right. That's all right. Johnny, does, that, does, does this issue in the back of your mind, um, the issue of racism, um, ever stops you from doing something, taking a step? Oh, no. I will n never allow another person's... Um, hatred keep me from doing what I know is the right thing to do. Um, the love in me is greater than their hatred. <laughs> That's all I can say. So again, this, the same saying says, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole world. That's right, and hopefully the light that we illuminate will mm -hmm. touch on their hearts in some way to realize mm -hmm. that it's better to be a part of this package yeah. to be on, than to be on the outside. Mm -hmm. what, what better way to uh, remove the darkness but to shed the light? Light, that's mm -hmm. right. So I have to be a part of that light, mm -hmm. and that's what I intend to be until I'm no longer on this earth. I'm going to be a part of the light. I'm going to try to spread the good news, the loving message that we're all brothers and we can live here in peace and harmony if we choose to. Mm. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it has been a wonderful um, talk with you, Joni. Keep up the wonderful spirit. Oh, thank we you, need Kate every Ron. single soul. Well, I appreciate your having me on this show. It's been wonderful. It has been a pleasure to have you. So uh, for our audience, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments about our program, please contact us through Baha'i Faith, PO Box 686, Claremont, California, 91711. And our phone number is 909-626-2569. For transforming human consciousness, thank you for being with us.